Okay. This is Navi Larson presenting her honors colloquium on um, the effects of eczema and its relationship to infection. I did my, uh, my honors project over the evaluation of eczema and kind of implementing it with the ideals of perfection. So just to start, I'm a senior, I'll be graduating next week, uh, majoring in pre-medicine biology with a minor in chemistry. And my focus, or the reason for the focus of eczema is because I've, I've had it for the 21 years that I've, I've lived. So I've always had eczema, it's never really gone away, I've had multiple flare-ups. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to get to know more about it. Um, and with that, we see a lot of society's ideals of how the skin should look and how the body should look. Um, and I think it's important for people to understand that that's not always attainable. Practically, it's never attainable, but that's kind of the idea of this project. So to start, we'll go over the definition of perfect. So perfect is an adjective, meaning being entirely without fault or defect, being Flawless. And this definition um, is according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, uh, and it's just, it, it gives a big overview of just how, really what it is. It, it's just not attainable. It's not something that people can actually attain perfection. I mean, you can say something's perfect, but relating to the body, that's such a harsh word to use. And so we see these always used in perfect skin for serums. We have different things, clear and brilliant, making sure that there's absolutely nothing left on any part of the skin. And we see that with makeup, even trying to just make sure that everything is just perfect. But really, is that attainable in, in today's society, and especially looking at skin diseases such as eczema? So my objective today is to inform people about eczema and how it affects the world population with the goal to change the ideals of skin perfection. So today I'll talk about eczema, kind of all about it. I'll talk about the causes of eczema, the symptoms and risk factors associated with it, the treatments available, current research being done, and an overall conclusion. All about eczema. So starting with the prevalence of one in 10 people across the world will eventually in some point in their life have eczema. Whether that's in infancy, whether that's uh, in young adolescence, adult, any age, someone, one in 10 will develop that. And this study right here was done in 2021 uh, with the CDC. And this is really looking at any allergic condition. Uh, however, I really wanna focus on more of the eczema aspect of it. So around 7.3 adults in the United States specifically said that they um, have a diagnosis of eczema. And looking at the children's side of things, 10.8% of children have eczema, which in my opinion, looking at both of these, it's kind of amazing to notice that it's larger than food allergies, which in my opinion was just a, a crazy thing to find, especially in now day and age. Um, but yes, the prevalence is, it keeps continuing to increase, um, but it is quite high, higher than I ever expected. So before I talk about eczema, I'll kind of dive into the background of the skin. So our skin is the largest organ in our body. It's the integumentary system. It has the function of um, being a barrier to any type of pathogens outside of our body, to allergens. It provides, um, the body with making sure that we can retain uh, water, that we can retain our, our electrolytes and nutrients that we need for the body. And it's made up of three different layers. So we have this top layer of the epidermis that's made up of your keratinocytes, is typically what you say, with um, all the cells that are there and immune cells that are infiltrated in there. We have the dermis, which has all your nerves, your blood vessels. You've got the end of your hair follicles with some glands, and then of course we have the hypodermis, which is like your subcutaneous fat. And so with eczema, we see it mostly infiltrated in this epidermal layer. And so we have the, um, the ability to have it be water retention. And with that water retention, it helps making sure that the body regulates temperature, that we're regulating and maintaining um, all the nutrients in our body, and we don't see that with eczema. So we have this loss of moisture because of the breakdown and the loss of tightness between all of these keratinocytes that we see. So 
there's a loss of barrier function. We have lichenified skin, which means that there's thickness and there's hardening of that skin. Inflammation will come in as we have an infiltration of allergens and bacteria and even immune cells. And then, of course, we can also see discoloration. So discoloration can be anything from just the redness that's presented with it as well as pigmentation changes. And so the type of pigmentation, we see hypo and hyper, and really there is no big difference between one skin color and which one they get. Um, they say that hyperpigmentation is really seen with those who have darker colored skin, but honestly, you see both um, with eczema, and it's all just dependent on, on the type and the, the person. There are two different main subtypes of eczema. There is contact dermatitis and atopic dermatitis. Contact dermatitis can be split up into irritant and allergic, which I'll dive into a little bit more now. Contact dermatitis is really seen on your face, on your hands, and on your neck. Uh, it is characterized by arrhythma and pruritus, and this is just reddening of that skin that you can see here. And pruritus is just that urge to itch, it's just the itching feeling that people can get, and it's really associated with eczema. Contact dermatitis really says what it is. It's in contact with things that um, can elicit uh, an immune response of some sort. And so that can be anything from nickel, fragrances, uh, poison ivy, and various other allergens that one may come into contact with. And then, of course, it can be split up into irritant and allergic. Irritant contact dermatitis is everything that I just explained. However, it does not elicit an immune response, which is kind of odd knowing how the body's supposed to help protect um, any of the injury in, of the skin. And so we see this is a great example of what may happen when someone can get contact dermatitis. And so skin injury will happen to all layers of the skin, any layers. And we do see an infiltration of those immune cells to that part of the body to try to heal the skin. However, with irritant contact, we don't see inflammation that's induced by those immune cells. We see inflammation induced due to the chemicals or the toxins released um, of the irritant that has infiltrated the skin. And so inflammation is induced only due to the chemicals that are presented. And this can be anything from the rubbing of a diaper in the groin region of a child as well as licking your lips. So that saliva can act as an irritant uh, and can actually cause the irritant contact dermatitis. Allergic contact dermatitis, on the other hand, has that immune response, and it uses um, T cells and elicits a type 4 hypersensitivity response. And what this means is it's kind of your typical allergy response, in my opinion, um, but it is a delayed response. So what happens is you're exposed to an irritant, and then you have a re-exposure, and that's kind of when that um, dermatitis will show up. And this can be due to things like the urushiol that we see in things like poison ivy and poison oak, which is just the sappy substance that comes out of it. And it can occur depending on the environment that you live in. So, or the environment you, um, you, you live in. And so things like washing your hands, you know, those working in healthcare constantly have to practice good hand hygiene. However, that leads to people having uh, very dry hands. Um, it just leaves them dry and it um, causes them to be susceptible to infections, to be uh, more easily irritated by other substances, and even using the types of soaps and um, hand sanitizers can also irritate the skin. So this diagram really gives a great visual as to the difference between the two. And there's a lot going on there, however, I'd like to focus on these bottom two. Uh, it's important to note that irritation is inflammation induced by the toxicity of that chemical that's infiltrated the skin, and allergic contact is by those T cells that have elicited um, the inflammation due to that immune response. On the other hand, we have atopic dermatitis. It's another subtype of eczema. It is one of the most common subtypes of eczema. There are about 7 to 14% of adults have atopic dermatitis, while 20% of children typically do. So it is seen more in children, but it can persist into adulthood. It is an anaphylactic reaction. It's kind of what the atopic part of it represents, and you can see scaly and itchy skin. Itchy is kind of a common thing with all eczema types, but the scaly is just such a dry skin that now you're starting to peel and it looks like 
kind of cracks in the ground. And these are mostly seen on the hands and in the flexures. So flexures such as in your elbows and then behind your knees. So now that we've kind of discussed the overview of eczema, now we'll discuss the causes. So there can be a genetic component to it that has been found. We have family lines and sporadic. And we often see this locus on the five, uh, on the fifth chromosome, specifically the 31 through 33, where there's a mutation. And this mutation causes an overactive immune system. And this overactive immune system is with those T helper um, cell uh, cytokines, and cytokines induce that inflammation. So it's kind of like what we were talking about with the allergic contact of dermatitis, where there's that uh, inflammation that's caused by just an overactive immune system. And here's another picture of it again that immune system can cause uh, eczema or a, um, any type of dermatitis. We see that all of these CCLs um, and even the interleukins up here, they are all play a huge role in eliciting that um, inflammation that we see within that skin. We can also have environmental factors that can cause eczema. Pollens and grasses, your normal, typical um, allergic responses or allergic type substances. We have detergents and soaps, uh, which if those have fragrances to them, it's all dependent upon the person. And what I found most interesting was uh, how people typically can have certain types of eczema or have eczema flare-ups during certain seasons. So in early fall and winter, during those very dry seasons, uh, it's typically where it increases. And of course, lifestyle habits. So there's actually been some studies that have been done to see whether uh, growing up in a rural or urban area has affected whether uh, you have a higher risk of developing eczema. And they actually did find that those in a rural community typically had uh, a decreased chance of having eczema just because they're exposed to all of those allergens uh, at an earlier age compared to those who lived in an urban area where you're typically not exposed to those. People who are constantly stressed, who have a constant fight or flight response are more susceptible to developing eczema. And this last one is still being researched. Uh, however, there is some idea that certain food exposure during childhood can also um, increase one's risk of, uh, or decrease one's risk of developing eczema. Now I will go into the symptoms and complications of eczema. So I think this graph really does a good job of really kind of giving the, the base idea. So common symptoms, really we're going to see itching and we're going to see um, that burning and that, that um, heat sensation that you get with eczema. So that daily urge to itch for adults is typically seen to be around 85% of adults that just have that even once a day itch, um, that eczematic spot. The constant urge to itch, so itching more than once a day, typically seen with over 60% of adults, and then that burning and stinging feeling associated with that, also over 60% of adults. So these symptoms are very, um, very uh, detrimental to the patients. So we see pruritus, that's just that feeling of itching, redness, inflammation, and a, the hardening of, and thickening of the skin, the lichenification. Complications that can arise with this, so due to that constant feeling of needing to itch, due to the uncomfortable feeling of having the eczema, we see a lot of people having sleep disturbance. 67% of adults typically have sleep disturbances with eczema. And for children, this becomes a problem with their growth. Uh, if they're not getting that proper sleep, if they're not getting that proper time to be able to recoup, they're not able to grow properly. 50% uh, of children with severe eczema also have a chance of developing asthma. And so there's been a lot of studies that have looked at whether there's a similarity between eczema, asthma, and allergies, and whether all of those are kind of interacting together, but nothing's been really um, set in stone. And then depression and anxiety is four times more likely in those who um, have eczema than those who don't. Diagnosing eczema, we can have a physical examination um, or patch test all done by a dermatologist or a primary care physician. Um, patch test kind of just looks at different allergens and irritants and it looks at the type of response that your skin has to that. But it is important to note that if you do have a response such as the allergic contact, that can take days for that to develop. Um, so it is a longer process, but it does give you specifically kind of what you're more sensitive to. Now 
I'll dive into the treatments of eczema. So we have topical creams that we can use. Non-steroidal is going to be your regular type of moisturizers. They're going to have that calcineurin inhibitor uh, type of um, working, and it reduces the inflammation that we see in that skin. And it's important to note that it's not for infected skin. Uh, neither really is the corticosteroids. Um, it's just really important to make sure that we eliminate that possibility of infection occurring. And then the corticosteroids is basically a type of steroid that's used to combat the, the eczema. And we have various potencies that can be associated with it, but it also can be very harmful. Um, and it can have a loss of pigmentation, which is a give and a take when thinking about different treatments because with eczema, you're going to have discoloration either way. If it's just a little bit more with the topical steroid, but it gets rid of it, it might be worth it. Uh, but overall, they restore the barrier function of the epidermis. Systematically, we can see immunomodulators that um, help with uh, treating eczema. We have oral or intravenous types of methods. Typically, oral medications are going to be ones that really combat the infection that's associated with eczema. So there's a high uh, prevalence of uh, infections associated with it. And then intravenous, just injections such as those of like Dupixin, if you see that. Um, through the ads, that's one type of uh, systemic treatment that's available now. And something new that's been looked at are your probiotics. Um, we see probiotics with the Bifidobacterium lactis and the Lactobacillus bacteria, and they have that probiotic effect that help kind of um, really stabilize that gut microflora, which has big implications in allergies and various other diseases. And of course, treatments can be done with daily habits. So things such as removing the irritant or the allergen from the environment that you're consistently in, constantly applying moisturizers, making sure that skin is as hydrated as you can be. And then of course, with infants, making sure that there's mittens or socks on their hands so that they're not constantly scratching their face. Current research being done, we have biomarkers that are currently being utilized. So a big thing with eczema is that it's really hard uh, to differentiate with psoriasis in some conditions, whether it's a severity. Um, sometimes it's a little bit easier, but typically it's, it's not. It's a, it's a hard thing to really differentiate. So they're finding these biomarkers, these two proteins that are upregulated either in psoriasis or in eczema, which is kind of a cool thing, and it would be very interesting to see how far this would go. Targeted therapies are being looked at for the different types of bacteria that are being uh, found to infect the skin. And so like Staphylococcus is a huge one that does that. And the competing coagulase negative Staphylococci is just one way to be able to kind of combat that. And they're looking more into that. And then the lactobacillus, again, just that probiotic function of just targeting that area of the skin. And then preventative measures that they're doing research on, again, prebiotics and probiotics. They've done a lot of studies with women, pregnant women specifically, to see if that would decrease the chance of their children having eczema. They were to take prebiotics and probiotics. And then, of course, consistent moisturizing. Whether that's actually effective for preventing eczema, hard to tell, but there still is research being done. So in conclusion, I've kind of gone over the causes, the treatments, the symptoms, and the further research that's implicated with eczema. And what I've kind of gone down to is the causes and the lengths of treatment um, are not always controllable for a patient. So a patient can always have, uh, their causes can be a wide variety. Um, and it could, it's things that you can handle and things you can't handle. And then for treatment, sometimes a treatment works, sometimes you gotta switch it up. And, a lot of times patients find that it comes back consistently. And then in terms of skin diseases, really societal norms should really be reevaluated of whether perfection of the skin is something that really should be attained in today's society. At the end of my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Meat Hart for being my advisor throughout this process, Carhartt Science Department, um, the Honors Department and Program, and Wayne State College for providing me this opportunity to present today. Are there any questions? So I'm curious, uh, yeah. eczema can be found anywhere on your body, right? So yeah. what about um, in, on your scalp? 
like if you have eczema on your scalp, are there treatments, topical treatments that are available? That is a very good question. I think there's a lot of um, shampoos that kind of help with that to be able to help moisturize and give that, um, give the scalp an ability to heal. Because it is a hard area because, I mean, that's where all your hair is and you don't want to remove that. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's as common of an area, but it is something that's definitely worth doing more research into because, I mean, that's, that's huge. So. And it's the moisturization, if that's a word, that's, kind of the key is, as you've said a couple times in your presentation, keeping it moisturized from the top will help. It helps, a it's, it's such a hard thing because it, it helps, but it can always come back and there's just a variety of issues with it, so. What about areas of the body that are not skin, so mucous membranes? We have inflammation and, and eczema-like symptoms associated with those. Um, I think I did see a couple times where there was some, some symptoms of that. I don't think it's as, as prevalent as we see on the outside of our body, but there were um, some treatments that were important for, mm -hmm. for areas like that um, to be able to help. Yes. Is it normal to cause like your hands to bleed? Hands to bleed with it? Yeah, I mean, if it, if it gets so dry that it's now kind of, it's so cracked. I mean, you got to like crack skin in the winter time. They go that just all the time <laughs> for some people, um, but yeah, it, it, it can't be. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So you mentioned how, uh, no, see if, um, so you mentioned how uh, location of where a person lives, whether it's in the city or in the country, and then also seasons can affect it. Have you seen any research and any data um, talking about where you might live in the world or in the United States if there's higher cases in, say, colder states or in warmer climates and stuff like that? I don't know if they've really looked at the climate aspect of it, but there are varying prevalences um, of eczema uh, depending on where you live. So I think typically in Europe it's a little bit lower, which is strange, but in other places um, it's quite a bit higher. US, the U.S. is kind of seeing just kind of a kind of a midline. There's not really an improvement or a decrease. It just kind of fluctuates. But um, yeah, that's a good question.